The proceeding will start shortly. Good morning, everyone, and uh, a particular greeting to our two uh, witnesses this morning. Um, and I realize it's not morning for you, but uh, welcome nonetheless. And thank you very much for giving up the time to be with us. This is our first session after the summer recess. And we're really looking at the experience of people in other parts of the world of um, the whole uh, issue around coronavirus and how it's impacted on public services. And we're really um, uh, uh, pleased to be able to host this session so that we do think a bit more broadly outside of um, uh, just what's been going on in this country. Um, uh, we do have uh, an hour for two witnesses. Um, uh, we have Todd Kreibel, from, uh, who's Deputy Chief Executive of the New Zealand Institute of Economic Research, and Audrey Tang, who's Minister Without Portfolio um, in Taiwan, and has been doing a lot of work around data and uh, uh, use of data in tackling the virus. So I'm really pleased that you're both here. And uh, I want to open the questioning um, by uh, firstly to asking Todd, what, um, what fundamental strengths and weaknesses in, uh, has COVID-19 revealed in the New Zealand model of public service delivery and in government culture? Uh, thank you, Baroness. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, maybe just opening with a little, a little bit of context. I think that we have recognised that good public health is good economics. We've had to rely very much early on on, I guess, what I would describe as textbook use of traditional public health measures. So it's been the isolation, the social distancing. And we honestly have not had a lot of choice because some of the public health function has been a bit neglected and run down. Um, and initially, we probably didn't actually have enough capacity to do some of the contact tracing. The virus was a little bit, the R value was a little bit, things were spreading a bit faster than we could track things down. And it would be fair to say that we probably weren't more than maybe a week or two away from being another Italy. We did go hard and fast, but only just. Um, and I think we also had the opportunity of being, a, you know, an island nation in a fairly small country. Um, we know that the first lockdown that we had in April took about $20 billion off GDP. That was three years of GDP growth wiped off just in that brief period. But no one is arguing that that was the wrong thing to do. Uh, the government has had a very strong monetary response with the quantitative easing and a very strong fiscal response as well. Um, the cornerstone of that would be some of the wage subsidies. But it is fair to say that um, some of the strengths of the, public, of the public service have come to the fore and been particularly important at this time. Uh, we, there'd be two things I'd highlight. One is that we do have a really strong culture of cooperation. So it would be the case that all of the cabinet papers and all of the coordination was done jointly and that it wouldn't be acceptable really for any department to go off on its own without having done that proper consultation with the other departments that had a major interest. And that, that's, that's just part of the way the culture is. And I know from the senior roles I've had in the health ministry uh, the Prime Minister's Department and Minister, Ministry for the Environment. That is just the way you do things. And there's sort of a, uh, I guess, a social system or a, you know, a peer system that it just wouldn't be tolerated to, to be anything less. And I think the second fundamental strength is we have had very high levels of public trust and social license going into this. So early April, the, um, the, the, the survey firms were looking at um, a question think that was thinking about how the New Zealand government is responding to the coronavirus outbreak. Do you think the measures they've put in place are, and then it was about right. The response to that in early April was 60%. And by the end of April, it was over 80%. So I think the fact that we had some strong um, trust and social license going into that really was, if nothing, only strengthened during the course of that first, that first lockdown. Um, but there are some weaknesses, I think, that have been revealed in the public service model. So notwithstanding that I think we have a very strong culture of cooperation, I think we also also saw that some departments have their own cultures. And you'd be aware of that. I mean, I, I, with my health background, for example, I would say health people can be very caring. 
um, very much about patient choice. But uh, in this case, it's actually quite a, you're flipping that around and the patient is in fact the population and we're uh, seriously thinking about protecting a group of 5 million, which is a, a slightly different um, scenario to what I think health people have been used to. And we have, we did see some cases slip out. People were left to go home to self-isolation if they didn't feel well, they were meant to sort of let health authorities know, which is, it's not surprising now that the border management is being done by, it's led by an air marshal. And the number two is from the Department of Corrections, because I think they've had different cultures about maybe perhaps more rules-based um, approaches to things. So I, it's been a very interesting lesson for us, I think, in bringing together some different cultures to uh, fit for, with those cultures and those, those services which are most fit for the job, I think, has been one thing that's revealed itself. Uh, the other really important thing I think we've um, identified is and if you work in health and safety in the workplace, you know, you know the, the terms about uh, work is imagined and work is done. So I know, for example, the Prime Minister and the Director General of Health had this idea that certain things were happening. So, you know, it was in their mind that this was that certain things would be happening with testing, with uh, PPE. But you get this drift in implementation where things aren't on the ground, on the front line, exactly where they're quite meant to be yet. So I think that whole monitoring function has revealed itself as being absolutely critical. And I can see in your role as parliamentarians, it's the kind of thing you wanna be asking people on the front line what's going on because if their reality is a little bit different from what you're hearing from um, senior public servants and you've got a bit of a, a dissonance there. Mm -hmm. So that was probably the other thing I think that really revealed itself as a bit of a weakness for us. That's very interesting. I have any of my colleagues do any of them want to ask a question here? If not, I want to ask, what about the link between national and local government? I mean, I know- So that's, yes, yeah, so that's an interesting one. We do have a lot of local government for a small country. So we have 80 district councils and we have 20 district health boards. Um, there's just been some a big review of the health and disability services and it looks as if we will have fewer district health boards soon um, and I think everybody thinks we have too much local government but it, it was an issue because while the director general had direct powers under the health act to make things happen that the staff that had to do things were employees of the district health boards or would be sitting out in local local government so there was um, more coordination than you might think would be needed or required. And I think that is definitely an issue. And I, that, that's come up quite a bit, I think, recently. So I think there's some issues around whether or not we do see some consolidation, particularly of some of the public health services. I, I know that there are some changes happening with Public Health England um, and elsewhere around the world, too. People are having a fresh look at some of the public health functions. I think here we're realizing that we probably need a bit more, honestly, a bit more centralized approach to some of that. That's interesting. Um, I'm going to ask Lord Davis to come in with his question there. Okay. Um, so uh, my, my question is for Audrey Tang. And um, it's uh, given your extensive experience in digital communication at uh, clearly a strategic oh, level. Nice. Um, what, what can we learn from Taiwan's experience of COVID-19 about how digital technologies can be used to improve and perhaps democratize public service such as health education and local government to the benefit of uh, the people. Thank you. Um, in Taiwan, um, we have a very easy to remember three pillars of what we call digital social innovation strategy. It's called fast, fair, fun. Um, the fast part, uh, and I think by far the easiest to, to adapt and copy to other jurisdictions, is simply uh, setting a very simple toll-free number, in our case 1922, where everybody can just call um, and report the on-the-field experiences that uh, Todd was just talking about um, to the call center. And the call center basically listens at scale, so that at each and every live-streamed um, uh, central epidemic uh, command center press conference, they answer all 
all the questions that is proposed to them uh, in the previous day uh, when we're still in the pandemic stage or, or now every week. And so this very quick iteration cycle, for example, the boy who called saying that I don't want to go to school because all I have is pink ration masks um, resulted in the very next day, everybody in the medical offices um, live stream watching uh, this uh, 1922 report uh, just don the pink medical masks so the boy become the most hit boy in the class. Um, that is a classic example of a very quick iteration by radically essentially crowdsourcing citizens' ideas. And the fair part pertains uh, to, for example, where ration out the mask, making sure that people can see, and this has been de deployed in Korea as well, um, in real time, where the mask is not, where the mask uh, still have some stock. Uh, and if you click on it and people queue in line um, and you swipe your national health insurance card, uh, people queuing after you actually see the number decrease in real time every 30 seconds. Again, this is a way for participatory accountability to garner trust is only capable with digital technology such as essentially a distributed ledger. And finally, the fun thing is about internet memes, which is cute dogs and cats uh, mostly. Um, so for example, these are social distancing um, mean, uh, which says that uh, in outdoor spaces, you have to keep three, uh, uh, sorry, two Shiba Inus away and indoor uh, three Shiba Inu away. And that Shiba Inu, uh, the spokesdog of our uh, health and ministry, uh, literally is a companion animal of our hashtag officer, the participation officer of the Ministry of Health, so that uh, we very early on say, you wear a mask to protect you from your own unwashed hands, which connects mask use and hand sanitation, which is the most important link uh, to get out. So basically have science, uh, give science a higher R value than conspiracy theories. That's something uh, that other jurisdictions can also look into. Very interesting. Uh, can, I, can I just come back on that quickly? Can, can yes. you just ex expand it? Could you just expand a bit on that call center issue and how that operates? So oh, we lost that. Hmm. Um. Yes. So um, the call center is both a toll-free number uh, and also a chatbot uh, and also a website. So it has many different um, APIs, application programming interfaces, uh, just like the mask availability map where there's more than 140 different um, applications. Uh, the chatbot slash um, toll-free number basically enable anyone to uh, use their preferred uh, way uh, to ask questions to the CECC. If it is a question that is already freshly answered, the newest answer gets turned into cute dog pictures and circulates around on social media. Uh, but if it's a novel, uh, a new idea, like the pink mask or the use of traditional rice cooker uh, to disinfect the mask, which is a real thing, uh, then uh, it becomes the, the content of the next day's uh, live streaming. And so this is both a listening device, but also a co-creation ideation device. Thank you. OK. Can I now go back to uh, Lord Bourne to ask his question to Todd Kreibel? Certainly. Uh, so th th thanks, Chair, and, and thanks to our uh, two witnesses for joining us. And yes, my question is, is uh, specifically really for Todd. Um, obviously, we've been watching in the UK the experience in, in New Zealand with, with great interest. We too are a, a small island, obviously, with a much larger population, but our experience has been uh, very different. And I just wonder if, if Todd could perhaps expand on some lessons that he think we, thinks we could learn in the United Kingdom. Uh, clearly, the whole government reform that he's been a central part of with vast experience has been part of it, which he touched on. Um, public trust in this country has uh, gone from a, a high level to a, a lower level, the, the, the reverse experience it seems to me from from New Zealand. So I just wonder, perhaps, if you could expand on factors which which he thinks have led to the success, uh, certainly in relative terms, in New Zealand, great success, and, and what we can learn in the UK. Yes, uh, thank you, Lord Bourne. Yes, so aside from the uh, things I mentioned about that strong culture of cooperation and coming into this with a high degree of trust, the other thing that came has come through very clearly is the listening to experts. So we have had, uh, the epidemiologists are now all rock stars in this country because they've really had a lot to say and it has been interesting to see, particularly the academic, including some of the retired academics have had a lot to say very publicly and it's clearly come through in the decision. So this has been an interesting aspect too, I think, for the public service um, who would have been putting up advice to ministers and as you know, that gets considered as free and frank and without fear or favor, but has done at least initially in private. But this has been 
much more of a public discourse. Uh, we've also had something called the Science Media Center where there are actual um, people that have been trained up to be spokespeople that are go-to, go-tos if you like for the media. So it manages some of that um, fake news situation that you, you know that we have worldwide. There really were, a, there were, there was a real flight to authority, I think, by the media. So that listening to us experts was really key. Um, I think the other key thing for us too is that it was touch and go, but we did, with the expert advice, end up with this idea of an elimination strategy. So it's not to say that we wouldn't have COVID outbreaks, but that we would be able to stamp them out pretty quickly. And it was a decision that was made yeah, based on the expert advice that we could actually achieve this. And I know in, we questioned some of the early WHO advice where the WHO advice was that you really shouldn't do border restrictions, but um, I think w, some of that advice to us hadn't been considered at the scale of smaller island nations. I, I would say we're probably a bigger island nation, but um, as you are, but it does seem to be something that allows for a different form of management of the, um, of the pandemic. So I think some of that border management and isolation and quarantine combined with that broad approach was the right thing. But the other, the other thing for us importantly, I think was the communications around the alert levels and this idea of having a bubble. So we've had four real clear alert levels. So people kind of understood if you're going up levels or if you were dropping down levels, you could see that things were gonna get tighter or you, you actually had hope that things would then, you know, the PM would be signaling, the prime minister would be signaling when we might be dropping down levels. A lot of this was well telegraphed, so people had a sense of when we might be coming out of some of this. Uh, the concept of bubbles then was introduced, I think that was pretty much levels three and four, where we had to define what a unit was. And to be, this also, I think, in, raises some very interesting issues about society and what constitutes a bubble, because we had, as you would know, you've got blended families and you've got households that might just be students flatting together or something. So. It raised some interesting issues about that, but there was a real concept of what it meant to be in a bubble. And that was very important early on for making sure we controlled some of that. And that was just a communicate, a simple communication device that was, I think, very effective. Um, the other thing I'd point out is that you did see with that communication each day at one o'clock, it became the must watched show of the day was to watch the PM's um, um, press conference. And in that conference, you had what they ended up calling it was the quint. So there were five key players in that. There was uh, the quint. So a, a group of five. So it was John Ombler, who was the national controller. He was a former deputy state services commissioner. The now retired police commissioner, Mike Bush. You had uh, Ashley Bloomfield, the uh, director general. You had Sarah Stewart Black, who was the controller of civil defense. And there was another fellow, Peter Crabtree, who was, was providing some of the overall um, national strategy coordination. So you had this visible group of five that all appeared at some time with the prime minister. So the point there being that there were identifiable leads within each of the various departments. So in fact, except for one of these, none of them were the chief executives of the department, but they were very senior identifiable people that were the go-tos. And those were the ones that were providing that, that tight coordination. So I think that that was also very clear. I mean, it does, we do benefit from having a relatively small Public service people do know each other, um, and you'd be, they'd be at meetings together, you know, on from time to time. So having that relationship capital, I think, was also very important. Thank you, um, Lord Bourne. Did you want to come in again? Well, just to say that the uh, epidemiologists as rock stars is going to stick with me. I think that's a really important point, and uh, <laughs> perhaps we've got something to learn on that alone. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I don't think they ever would have expected it, but there you go. <laughs> um, I'm now going to ask Lord Young. He wants to come in with a supplementary. Yes, this is a question for Todd, and I want to pick up something mm -hmm. he said about the public service model. One of the issues we've come across uh, as our committee has made progress is mm -hmm. the criticism of departments acting as silos and being reluctant to uh, uh, cooperate with each other. And I was very interested in something that was in the briefing we got about New Zealand, which says, the way you tackle this, it seeks to achieve this by setting up interdepartmental boards to address high priority issues, bringing together chief executives from relevant government agencies. The boards will have the power and budgets to deal collaboratively with challenges such as reducing child poverty. Now, how exactly does that work? On the budgets, do they get the budgets direct from the Treasury, or does each of the departments that are contributing to this chip in? 
Uh, do ministers so, sit yeah. on these boards? And what is the what is the method of accountability of these interdepartmental boards, and how many are there? So thank you, Lord Young. Uh, this is a great question. So under the new Public Service Act, there is this possibility of having these joint ventures or these chief executive boards, as you say. Uh, it's still very much in its infancy, and I was fortunate enough, acting for the Director General, to have been the health uh, representative on briefly for the family and sexual violence um, joint venture, which is actually the first one. So that's it's essentially leading things out. Um, it, that one has chief executives on the departments that you would imagine are relevant to, to those issues. I would say it's still finding its way somewhat, but the idea is that everyone commits to a unified plan for that um, joint venture and you, you don't have your own departmental work streams on that. You bring everything there and the decisions are made collectively so that it, it really is um, a, a unified effort um, on those cross <coughs> departmental issues. What, what it's doing, I think, also in, in large part, it's stopping departmental budget bidding wars so that all of the budget bids to the treasury would go through that joint venture. You couldn't have an outside budget bid. It's one that's agreed to by the joint venture. So by the time it gets to the treasury, it's understood as being um, the best offering from that collective for that joint venture. Um, a slight aside thing that's also happening here, I think, too, intended is it will stop employment bidding between departments for, for civil servants because you will be potentially on the same kind of pay grade and there'll be a bit more interchangeability and interoperability. So if you're a senior policy advisor, it's, it means the same thing across the public service. So I see it have, having some benefits, not just for whole of government, but also for the the public finance, this whole pub issue around the public finances and how we deploy our um, mm. our um, human mm. resources within the public services. It's still very much in its infancy, but I, I think it's it's promising at this point in time. The, uh, the, mm. the COVID groups have been ones that have existed for a while. I wouldn't say they're technically um, mm. set up as joint venture or chief executive boards, but they are de facto. Hilary, I don't want to press it, but I wonder if it's possible to have a a memorandum um, on uh, exactly this particular issue from Todd or his department, uh, giving us the background and the modus operandi of these interdepartmental boards, mm -hmm. because I think it's a really, a really interesting concept which might have some relevance here. Thank you. Yes, I yes, we can do that, Baroness. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Um, and now I've got Lord Filkin. Um, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Todd uh, and Audrey. It's a question uh, looking forward. Uh, mostly we've rightly been uh, on crisis response at this point in time, but I'd be interested in asking uh, what are, is the thinking in both New Zealand and Taiwan about the, the really big public policy questions that you now think in the light of the crisis require change. Um, without loading the question too much, uh, one of them for us uh, would certainly be about health prevention. Our system focuses on treating ill health much more seriously and it focuses on trying to keep people healthy. So I'd welcome uh, your thoughts um, on um, the public policy issues and priorities in the light of the crisis going forward mm -hmm. and if you wish to, to comment on the, the relevance of improving health, uh, health resilience individually and societally. Todd, uh, do you want to start off? Yeah, thank you, Lord uh, Falcon. Um, the one big project I would want to mention is that the at the Institute here, we've just gone, joined in partnership with, uh, with the Helen Clark Foundation, former Prime Minister, to look at inclusive growth for the next generation. We, we do see that some of this uh, impact of COVID, that it's very interesting to think about the distributional impacts of who, the, you know, if you like, the winners and losers are. Um, and we see it as a real, it's a crisis and it's an opportunity not to be wasted. And we really do want to use it to think about how we might um, think about things like pre-distribution rather than redistribution. It's, it's the opportunity to come up with some different new ideas about how we might um, yeah, provide, um, close some of the equity gaps for, for young people. We have definitely issues and COVID revealed this for Maori and Pacific populations. It's the disadvantage has just been revealed by COVID. So that we see, for example, mortality rates in Māori are about 50% higher than in the general population. So those, um, the opportunity now, I think, to deal with some of those equity and disadvantage issues are really coming to the fore. 
Very that interesting would be number indeed. one issue. Um, be really interesting if, again if there's a, an existing note on that because it's it's obviously thrown a light here exactly the same way um, certain groups certain individuals certain societies have been much more at risk than others and it's thrown the spotlight on those weaknesses so we would love to know more about your response to that thank you um, Audrey any comments from from Taiwan on that yeah, definitely. Uh, I would like to echo uh, what Todd said. Uh, and interestingly, uh, we also have our uh, quintuple in the daily uh, CECC press conference as epidemiologists uh, rock stars. Uh, and because in Taiwan, we um, benefit from the idea of broadband as a human right, which we have deployed um, since last year. So right in time of the pandemic, uh, anywhere in Taiwan, if you don't have 10 megabits per second at unlimited data at just 15 uh, euros per month, it's it's personally my fault. Uh, and so because of that, uh, our our top epidemiologists, uh, our chief epidemiologists, um, you know, crash courses on coronavirus, uh, which is a very well attended, um, massive uh, online open course. Uh, our top ep epidemiologist happens at a time to be our vice president. So when he wants to convince the president, he just knocks the door next door. But anyway, the idea is that we see that people uh, learn uh, and meet much more closely um, online because while we never had a lockdown, uh, we did uh, for a couple of months put restrictions on large gatherings. Um, and so we see a lot more like satellite learning, which also benefits the people who are more indigenous, the rural, the remote islands and so on, to basically engage uh, in a uh, co-presence, co-education uh, um, infrastructure. And that infrastructure benefits now from our 5G uh, auction because for the extra money that the 5G telecoms are put into the 5G bid, we make them to start a 5G deployment first in the under resources uh, places, the most rural places and so on, basically transform both our healthcare and education uh, using like this very cheap 5G virtual reality headset uh, for, for classrooms and things like that. So this is a great opportunity because the senior decision maker basically are, are forced to uh, encounter the latest in video conferencing technology and, and discover that it's nothing like what they remember uh, 20 years ago. It's actually pretty good nowadays. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Um, can we move on now to Lord Hunt? Thank you. Um, is this my sub substantive question, uh, Chair, or is this a follow-up? Am I allowed to follow-up? You're allowed to follow-up too. Okay. I was very interested in uh, Lord Filkin's question about the future. I wanted to ask you something too. I wanted to ask about vaccines and the extent to which both Todd and Audrey have given thought to, uh, you both mentioned uh, fake news. Have you given thought to strategies that will be necessary to persuade your people to take up the vaccine? Uh, Audrey, do you want to go first? Well, um, in Taiwan, um, we already had a um, habit of uh, wearing masks, which we do refer to as the physical vaccine. Uh, and um, because the numeric models shows if more than three quarters of people put on the mask and keep hand sanitation, uh, the R value will be consistently under one, which is as good as having a vaccine. Uh, and so we're not in that much of a rush to get everybody vaccinated. I have to say this first. And then um, beyond that, uh, we look forward to work uh, with our humor over rumor counter disinformation strategy, which is a consistent strategy that basically whenever there's a like anti-vax um, rumor that uh, you just alluded to, or whenever there was a like election interfering rumor uh, before our election, there was countless disinformation campaigns uh, about the Hong Kong protest and things like that. Uh, we take a uh, book uh, of the humor over rumor on um, putting a notice and public notice, meaning that instead of a administrative takedown, we work with the social media company so that there's a very clear public notice whenever it is uh, debunked by an international fact-checking network um, and including Taiwanese members of the Taiwan Fact Check Center. And then whenever you share uh, one of those um, disinformation on the social media, it will say like, for example, that this um, is a Reuters photo and it has been modified and recaptioned uh, by people who work on disinformation. And uh, this came from this certain Weibo account. Uh, and 
and things like that so that people learn the, the whole story, the whole narrative, and basically become uh, kind of amateur fact checkers uh, in their spare time to, to basically contribute into media. Well, we, we don't call it media literacy, we call it media competence. It's also part of our K-12 education. So basically enlist citizens' creativity in making, again, the humor spreads faster than rumor. Fascinating. Um, okay, Lord, Lord. No, we move now to Todd. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. So, I, what I would add to that, I think that idea of a physical vaccine is an interesting one. I'm going to use that. Um, I think we have had issues around vaccine hesitancy for some time, so that's not a new thing for us. Um, I, I would be thinking that we would again be relying on what we've been doing with this. I mentioned before the Science Media Center, and there is enough. There is enough comment in the media. I think that we perhaps could manage that, but I do know that when you're looking at herd immunity, you do have to make sure you get your vaccine levels up high enough. Um, in the folk I've been talking to, the specialists are saying, you know, there really, there, there have been no COVID vaccines. If you look at the probability, you know, if you look at the history of vaccines, they would take up to a decade or more to produce. Um, this one may end up more like a cold vaccine where you have to have it seasonally. So, I think here, while there's a lot of talk about vaccines, and there's a lot of hope that, and there's even this expectation that some very small universities would be producing them, I do worry about some false hope on that front. So I do think there's a little bit of a reality check needed on that. And it might be that, yeah, we need to be talking more about physical vaccines mm -hmm. for a while. It might be that there are some therapeutics coming as well that could help. But um, yeah, I think this is, again, one where we have relied very strongly on the advice coming with so the prime minister, she does listen to her um, chief science advisor, and we've seen that throughout. So I, I think we were just back from what we've seen, the um, quality of the uh, dialogue and, and media chasing the right sort of um, scientific advice would probably see us through. I'd, I'd only hope so. Thank you. Phil, your next question. Okay, so this is... Uh... Uh, to Audrey, and um, I was fascinated by your uh, description of fast, fear, and fun in terms of your, your strategy. M the impression I got, uh, and again from what you said about the use of masks, is the Taiwanese population has been largely receptive to the messages that have come from, from the government. And I just wondered, first of all, whether you could kind of confirm that or not, but then how do you think some of the techniques you've used in digital strat technologies can, which you've used to improve and democratize public services, to what extent do you think those are transferable to, say, the UK, with, that, with obviously a, a different political culture? Thank you for that question. Um, the, the first one, um, which is uh, really about why are people receptive of the um, science and clarifications and memes, um, of course, it's not just cute dogs, but because uh, we make sure that we amplify the best ideas from the civil society, from the social sector. That is to say, these are not our ideas. Uh, when people show that mask availability uh, map is better than the what, whatever tabulated PDF or whatever display is better, uh, then, then we take that, right? And every year we already have a culture, um, actually for uh, a few years now, uh, before the pandemic, we have this idea of a presidential hackathon uh, where every year the top social innovators, um, like more than 200 this year, uh, propose their idea on how to use data to form data collaboratives to, for example, reduce plastic use or measure air quality and water quality and so on. And the top five teams receive a trophy from our president each year. And a trophy is shaped like Taiwan with a micro projector that if you turn on the micro projector, it shows you Dr. Tsai Ing-wen handing you that trophy. So it's a self-describing trophy. Uh, and in that uh, small film, you will hear Dr. Tsai Ing-wen saying, whatever you did in the past three months, we commit to make it public policy, national policy in the 12 months afterwards. So basically, this is presidential power as Hackathon Prize. Um, and so this kind of co-creative culture naturally then incentivizes the social sector to bring their best ideas forward. And our 
it mostly is just to innovate those ideas. So if you ask a random person uh, on the street uh, back in March, uh, say, uh, and say, why are you wearing a mask? They will not say, oh, it's because the spoke stocks tells us to. They will say, um, you know, this is a great idea that we hear from this Professor Lai Chen Yu or, or whatever uh, that talks about traditional rice cookers and so on. And we put on the mask when the CECC tells us to, and we put on the mask when the CECC tells us there's no need to, because for 48 hours or so, we were wrongly saying that in well-ventilated places, uh, such as the metro um, stations, you don't have to put on the mask and people ignore that. And so we change our message very quickly, uh, just two days afterwards. So we learn uh, from this failure culture. I think that is the most uh, important thing to keep amplifying the best ideas, both from the frontline public service and also mm -hmm. from the social innovators. And that I think is transferable because Taiwan also had a culture of anonymous uh, civil servants. But when we really give credit to the uh, frontline public servants that come up with the good ideas, make them basically the heroes. And as ministers, we absorb the risk that changes the, um, you know, the matrix of uh, reward. And that will then make the social sector innovate more with the frontline public sector people. I think that part is transferable. Thank you. Can I just ask, I mean, you, you mentioned the impact of um, some of your experts. Uh, and clearly the UK, we have uh, experts as well, but they don't always agree with each other. And we've had, I think one would call a healthy debate right from the start of this crisis, uh, where there've been legitimate disagreements between scientists, public health doctors uh, about the approach that continued. I just wondered uh, if you had also experienced um, conflicts between the experts and how you moderated that? I think, um, so in Taiwan, we benefit from this societal inoculation from the 2003 SARS, uh, nowadays I should call it SARS 1.0 um, incident uh, in which uh, we had to lock down an entire hospital unannounced and with no uh, fixed termination date of that lockdown. Uh, it was very traumatic. Everybody above 30 years old remembers that incident, which is why we are so averse against lockdown, which is why we never had a lockdown in the first place. Uh, and so basically the consensus of the scientific community, while it of course differs and legitimate debates on SARS 2.0, which is novel coronavirus, uh, exist. Basically the baseline is we do whatever we do, uh, assuming that this is the same as SARS 1.0. And so that formed a baseline consensus. On top of that, for example, around mask use, uh, the asymptomatic, of course, is the main difference between SARS 1.0 and 2.0. But uh, the message, and I quote, um, wear a mask to protect you from your own unwashed hand. That has brought agreement. So it's rough consensus. We push that out first, and then we deliberate whether asymptomatics, whether masks are useful or not on the scientific debate. But the one that has rough consensus, we first push them out uh, with the spoke stocks and so on. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, any of my colleagues would like to come in on this? No. Um, can um, I have uh, possible? Yes. Hi, can I come up just back quickly on Lord Hunt's question, which I very much agreed with, just taking mm. that on. Um, the point about doctors as rock stars, that's great, mm. but how did you manage the potential political tension if as, political, as your political leaders are having to make decisions that assess risk that might not be able to be completely in line with a pure medical view of simply containing the virus? Uh, I think that's more of a thought question because in Taiwan, as I said, the author of the textbook on epidemiology was literally the vice president. Yeah, Todd, do you want to go on that one? Oh yeah, I think that's been an interesting one here too. There was a point where I think the prime minister was almost beginning to get criticised a bit much for listening almost too much to the science, and that she was the you know she get gets paid the big bucks to make the difficult political decisions on things, but I think we were so successful and we've been so successful to date that that's just gone away. I mean, there was some discussion around, oh, we should be taking a bit more of a Swedish approach on things, but I think the, this, the, the, the proof's in the pudding and the eating, and I just think we've managed, we've managed to get through this and there ended up being very little opposition to it. Even with the election coming in a few months, you, you know, the, the opposition parties are all, if anything, giving the government a hard time for not 
you're not doing doing the job doing the policy as rigorously and as firmly as was set out so there really isn't any objection on the fundamentals there okay um okay uh, if there's no one else on that issue um can i bring in baroness keithley and just to warn the witnesses you won't see her because her ca the camera on the computer she's using isn't working this morning we apologize for that i my, and my apologies to the witnesses as well i'm, I'm so sorry about that um, it's been very fascinating to hear what you've had to say. Having worked with health and care services in New Zealand in the past, I've very much appreciated the way in which people do seem to know each other and work across boundaries. And many of your show and tell accessories, Audrey, we will remember for a very long time, I think. But I want to ask you actually now to sort of comment on the UK and how we've done, because you will have heard a lot about what's happened with us. And, and what do you think is the most important lesson? Um, and obviously this will come from your own experience. What do you think is the most important lesson that the UK should learn uh, when we go forward trying to redesign public services in the light of what's happened uh, in this pandemic? And perhaps you, you could start, Audrey, that would be all right. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, when I first became digital minister, uh, that was in 2016, uh, I modeled my office after a certain UK unit uh, called the Policy Lab. The Policy Lab, uh, which is part of the UK Cabinet Office, if I understand correctly, I did visit there, um, is at the perimeter of the government, basically kind of like a Lagrange point between the social sector uh, on one side using ethnographic or just hanging out uh, with the stakeholders. Uh, and then on the other side, of course, is the cabinet offices or its um, departments and silos and so on. And this has always fascinated me how we can apply the insights from design thinking uh, into policy making. Um, and I was also fortunate enough uh, that one uh, alum uh, from the policy lab, uh, Fang Rui Zhang, uh, Zhang who was a Taiwanese, actually returned to Taiwan to bring the policy lab uh, working methodologies with us. And now we work with other designers from, from IDEO, from uh, RCA, and so on, uh, on this uh, design aspect. And I think uh, the one thing that taught me um, that those uh, excellent interaction designers and service designers taught me is that uh, when you're doing design thinking, a lot of the um, cause of the policy that we think uh, solves things and actually causes more problems of externalities is because this inherent solutionism that is embedded within the bureaucratic culture that we have to do something and do it quick and solve a problem but in design thinking uh in the double diamond thing uh basically before delivering anything or developing anything it's important to ask the question uh, of this common value and then out of those very different positions is this something that people can live with so it's a solutionism is basically something that is perfect or near perfect right for a particular issue but uh a rough consensus is something that people can roughly live with and resonate with one another. And this uh, enlisted, for example, we use uh, assistive intelligence, that's AI, um, to ask people to rate and rank uh, acceptable measures of using digital technologies to counter the coronavirus in the collaboration with the de facto US Embassy, the AIT, on the coronavirus hackathon, co-hack.tw. And every time we see the large debates on the divisive parts, and then we promptly ignore those. And then uh, we only act on the one that has broad consensus, no matter which ideological camp um, that the people are. And so basically crowdsourcing the agenda, stepping back a little bit to define common values. I think that is one part that has worked really well in our counter coronavirus, but as well as any other large broad, um, you know, structural issues facing the society when we're designing policy. Thank you very much. And Todd, I think many of us would have been particularly interested in what said about joint budgets with, with departments. Uh, if you could include that in your answer, please. Sorry, Vanessa, do you mean in terms of uh, some of the use of technologies? 
or no i was i was thinking about about the um the way that you talked about having uh, joint budgets uh, in in the team working across departments yes so that the joint agreed, ventures will be joint budget yeah, so the joint ventures will be putting together, um, have a direct appropriation for whatever it is that their, their, their particular area of focus is. So I think that is that will be a much tardier way to make sure that resources are, are, are being, uh, you know, corralled and channeled appropriately and not being, you know, the best project, the best offering from different departments and try to, and try to you know, bring those together and coordinate those after the fact i think it's much it'll be much tardier if we can get that working effectively and as i say it's really just that family and sexual violence one at the moment there'll be others on their way soon and i i, I can give you some more information on that thank you and has that kind of approach been particularly important in your work with coronavirus well, I think it has been the de facto, it's all happened so quickly. I think it is in, the, as I was saying earlier, it is in the culture of the way we just do things. Um, that new legislation, that new Public Service Act will make that a bit more, give a bit more structure around that. And as I said, particularly around some of those budget things and those lines of reporting and accountability. So it'll, it should only get better from here, I think. And, and again, I think just, yeah, the, 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 um, the coronavirus thing has been a great example of that, even though it wasn't done officially and formally. And in terms of your advice to us, um, you mentioned silos, and we've had a lot of problems with silos, as some of my colleagues have mentioned. Is that one of the things that we should tackle most urgently when we're thinking about uh, public service reform? Well, I, th I, th I would say you have to, because all of the interesting and difficult public policy issues are in the interface. They're not solely within a health silo or a primary industry silo or the environment silo. They're ones that cross. And we talked earlier, Lord Falcon, about some of the prevention things. You know, you're not going to deal with some of these issues around disadvantage and improving health status unless you deal with basic, you know, security of tenure of housing, um, security of, of income, uh, sta stable family or household units. These, these things are coming from wider social um determinants that need to be factored in and unless you're working so we do have within the prime minister's unit at the moment a child poverty and we unit we need to do much better on that we didn't score very well on the latest unicef um report but that's the kind of thing that unless you're working collectively across that you're not you, individually everyone just ends up uh, pointing their fingers at each other and you'll never get there yeah yeah thank you very much for reminding us of the breadth of our agenda thank you very much chair Thank you, um, Baroness P. Uh, now I have uh, Lady Tyler, who would like to come in. Thank you very much. Um, and it's a follow up question, really, from the point that Baroness P. Keithley was just asking, and indeed, which Lord Young uh, raised earlier, about particularly in New Zealand, this new approach for cross government working um, and looking at the difficult issues. With, with different sorts of accountability uh, structures, budgets, ways that civil servants work, et cetera. All countries have faced very difficult trade-off issues about the balance between sort of health outcomes, keeping the public safe, and the impact on the economy. Um, and I was interested to know whether you felt that this new way of looking at cross looking at issues on a cross-government basis had actually made some of those trade-offs, e those decisions easier to make and sort of with gaining greater acceptability with the public as well. And perhaps Todd could start with that. Yes, thank you, Baroness. I, well, the way I look at these joint ventures is that they are really trying to um, unify around not just one, but there are multiple policy objectives in place. So it means that you know, there might be health objectives, but there also might be some policing objectives. There might be some other um, child well-being objectives. Um, and the joint ventures can, can grapple with those more, I think, because they, they, they take responsibility for each other's. And it isn't just simply looking after only your own single siloed set of objectives. So I think that really is where that value comes through and that accountability. They're accountable collectively for multiple policy objectives. They're not left to their own departments and their own budgets on that. Could I specifically just ask, was there a joint board that was looking at that issue about the sort of how, how to balance the competing objectives around public health safety and, the, and keeping the economy going? 
What, so what I would say on that one is that that quint that I mentioned, that was the role of that group very much to coordinate that. I don't think it was actually officially set up as a chief executive board or joint venture, but I can, but I can confirm that if, um, if you, if you allow me, Baroness Armstrong, I'll come back with something on that. But it was, as I say, it was a part of the culture of the way we just do things. So even if it wasn't formally set up quickly enough, it was, yeah, just the, it's the, it's the expectation. And that's exactly the kind of thing I think we'll see with more chief executive boards and joint ventures coming. Thank you. Audrey, is there anything you'd like to add from how those trade-offs were sort of dealt with in, in Taiwan? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, we, we actually probably will record a GDP growth this year. So uh, dude, that that's not much of a trade off that we, we have to make. Uh, but uh, I think one of the key uh, of that is basically our, our uh, quint uh, basically um, shared very early on in advance uh, that says if we achieve elimination as defined by four weeks with zero locally transmitted or confirmed cases, uh, then we can safely move on to the stimulus part, the revitalization part, and of course we kept our words. So right after that is the stimulus part, and we have this triple stimulus vouchers where you can spend only outdoors and not on e-commerce. If you spend outdoors uh, 100 British pounds, uh, you can withdraw two thirds of that back from your nearby friendly automated teller machine uh, and things like that. So it's, it's a way to uh, stimulate <laughs> the, the economy. And and one of the reasons why that uh, this trade-off is uh, not seen as a trade-off is, for example, um, I'm the digital minister, but my full title really is the minister of portfolio in charge of the public digital innovation space. And the PDIS really is not a minister Ministry. It is literally just a space, and it looks like this. Um, it is a re really fun, like park uh, in the central uh, central part of the Taipei city uh, with public art by people with Down syndrome, uh, treatment differences that are very creative. And so people from 12 different ministries stationed here from section chief level uh, all the way to director general level. Uh, and they still work with their own ministries and departments. The only thing I ask them is to work out loud uh, and share whatever they have learned with uh, whatever um, other people that may uh, occur in that place. And I hold public official um, you know, office hours there and tour Taiwan too. So all this is it's just to make sure that everybody know what everybody else is working on. This is not a joint uh, budget program, but this really is a joint horizontal communication program. Thank you very much. Well, that was fascinating. Uh, and I think has demonstrated just how much um, we have to learn from around the world. Uh, and so it's been a really interesting and useful session. Can I just check that I'm not stopping anyone who would like to ask a question. Oh, I think um, uh, we've explored with both Taiwan and New Zealand. I think um, Lord Filkin's trying to come in. Oh, is he? I can't see him. Right. OK, Lord Filkin. Just briefly, uh, fascinating sessions. Would love to get more detail on the innovation process as described by Audrey Tang. Um, and also as a subset of that, uh, the insights from design thinking. I think we've got a lot to learn on that. A very quick question, if it's possible to both of you. Um, we've, um, you're both talking about more open and porous forms of mm -hmm. policy making and implementation. Um, we still feel um, in the light of this crisis that it's been a central dominated process, uh, largely run, I, I'm mm -hmm. caricaturing, behind traditional civil service boundaries and mechanisms. Um, how has the central local nexus worked and has there been a participative relationship between central policy making and delivery and local policy making delivery? Um, may I take on this? Yeah. Or maybe, not. I mean, I, I'm fine either way. You go. You go. Okay, right. Uh, well, Taiwan, although uh, we're a um, well, officially, a, a transcultural republic of citizens, a country with uh, 23 million people, uh, but it's actually a, a quite small uh, place, right? Taking the high-speed rails from Taipei to the southmost uh, municipality of Kaohsiung is just an hour and a half. Um, and so it feels like just a slightly larger municipality when you look at uh, geography-wise. And so this enabled the Central Epidemic Command Center to very quickly, it, it essentially tour Taiwan uh, and look at how things really 
are and also share with the local municipality which uh, plays a supportive role and I think this is uh, what we learned from SARS because when SARS 1.0 came the Taipei municipality were issuing reverse directions from the health bureau uh, and VP Chen Jianren uh, was actually the director of the health minister at the time uh, and so I, I think he learned the lessons and then the uh, constitutional court uh, charged the legislature to design a central command system so that anyone be their local level or central level if they put on those uh, you know uh, jackets that the, our, our quince puts on they automatically become part of the CECC um, um, command chain, uh, the infrastructure, and so that it has a very clear uh, line of report. And so the municipalities are definitely on the implementing role uh, instead of a, you know, uh, the possibility of issuing countering policies. That was a big problem back in 2003, and we have took uh, legal and design and regulatory remedies to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, from Yes, from my, from my end, what I would comment on that is that I think we can do better between central and local government coordination. The one issue that's really come to the fore is in Auckland, which is the main entry point where most of the managed isolation facilities are. The council itself has definitely had a big business downturn, so its revenue is down. Yet uh, most of those cases are being managed out of Auckland and, and as a port of entry, it's really been one where the central and local government have had to come together quite strongly. Again, being a relatively small country, the mayor is a former labor minister, so he's he's well known to the center. So I'm sure that's helped. But I think that that for us has been the main thing. I know, for example, in the South Island, they're saying they're saying things like, "Well, we've had really very little, if any, COVID, and can't, why can't we move down to level zero and be completely free to run around?" So there are there are some differences, I think, between islands as well that have just um, they're just working their way through. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Well, as um, I hope both witnesses um, recognize, uh, we, we have really appreciated your contribution this morning. Uh, and um, thank you for coming at different and unusual times for you, but we really do appreciate it and it will be very helpful to us in our future deliberations. So thank you. Um, and the committee overall will be meeting again tomorrow um, and uh, uh, so um, I will see, uh, we will pursue um, the work of the committee uh, tomorrow in our more normal slot. But thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you, Baroness. Thank you. Luck with everything thank you. you're doing. Thank you. Have a good look at time. Live long, prosper. Mm -hmm. You too. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.